I'm going to hit record of the cloud so I can start recording and we're good. So let me find my notes I had here, Howard. Um, I'll ask you later. Um, I've got your about page on your web page um, and I could just create a, a blurb for the blog post notes or you can send me a link to your blurb that you or, or, tend to use. Um, my Patreon page has a... Has oh, a, that's the best one. Yeah, I, I yeah. know where that is and I've been there. So I'll, I'll grab it from there for the, okay, for the blog uh, notes on the show notes. Excellent. So let me get all the keys out of my pocket so I'm not making too much noise in front of my microphone. And we're recording. So today we have a special recording of episode 42, which I love the fact that it's number 42 of the Ask the Flip Learning Network podcast with Howard Rheingold. I had the distinct privilege to take a course this summer on augmented collective intelligence with Howard. I saw him offering it and I just couldn't turn down the opportunity to participate. Um, as always in these virtual courses, some of us participate more than others and at different times and we always feel guilty about not doing enough. Uh, maybe we'll get into the dynamics of what it's like to be in a virtual course. I'm also excited because I just started teaching my first online course. Uh, I'm in week three, week four of that now. And um, why don't I just let Howard tell us a little bit more about, about himself. Okay. Um, I wrote books, um, as it turned out, mostly about the impact of technology and increasingly about what we call social media for most of my life. I wrote a book called The Virtual Community in 1993 that looked toward what we now call social media. I've got um, my copy right here. And uh, I'll skip the other books. I wrote a, a bunch of books. Yeah, and, you did. Uh, and I will list a bunch. In the early 2000s, when, when, my, when my daughter was a college student, I was struck by the fact that, that college students were increasingly living in the online world, mm -hmm. yet educational institutions, as far as I know, uh, didn't really approach the issues that that raised. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't really use the media. Uh, there were a few people doing it, but by and large, it was kind of unknown. This was before the term social media really became known. Right. So, um, although I don't have a degree, by virtue of the fact that the virtual community was kind of the root text for what's now, a, you know, field of social cyberspace studies, uh, they allowed me to teach at Berkeley and at, at Stanford. And I created courses. Uh, first, it was called Virtual Community, and that was called Social Media, and then Social Media Issues and Social Media Literacies. And it, it only made sense at, from the beginning that if we were going to be studying issues about social media, and by that I mean identity, community, social capital, public mm -hmm. sphere, all of these issues that have roots in texts and disciplines that don't have anything to do really with the technology, but which offer context and ways of understanding what is happening um, to the, the, the people who are experiencing the changes that, that social media has been, been bringing. And it only made sense if we're going to study those issues to use those media to right. do it. So I started out um, at Berkeley and mm -hmm. then at Berkeley and, and Stanford, 2005 to 2015. Um, I asked my students to, to blog using one platform, to do collaborative work on a wiki, this is before Google Docs, mm -hmm. on another platform, um, and to use a forum on another platform. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things they told me was, well, we're learning all this, these, these new ways of accessing material, but we all have different interfaces and different uh, logins. So yep. I entered a, a competition that Haystack was, was doing um, and, uh, and, and won an award, which I used to pay a developer to create what I call the social media classroom. Um, something that really badly needs to be updated, and maybe we can circle back and talk about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it offered a, a, a browser-based environment in which different tabs in that, that browser could enable you to easily switch without having to log in to another one and with a uniform user interface from forum to blog to wiki. Um, so uh, that, was, that was 
part of it, the, the blended learning part of it, learning how to do that. Another part of it was I, I felt confident in my expertise in the, in the material, but I had no training in teaching. And right. I remember the kind of the fear of <laughs> students finding out yes. that I was learning along with them. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think the, um, I, I could think of like the, the major change for me was confessing that I was learning along with them and I didn't completely know what I was doing and let's see if we can mm -hmm. figure it out. And, and, uh, and I think ultimately, if you wanted to ask me what was the one, one thing I learned about teaching was the, 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 the power of student agency, of turning more mm -hmm. of it over to them. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I think this relates to some of the things that you've said. Very about much, the, the, very much. The classroom. So I started saying, look, I'm gonna throw a lot of things at you and you tell me what gets you excited about learning, what, what really makes sense to you mm -hmm. and, and what doesn't. And um, I kind of skipped the, the, the middle of the de details here, but, but yeah. I ended up uh, doing uh, a couple things. One was um, moving, the, moving the chairs into a circle. Okay. I didn't invent this. If, if, you, if you look, You'll you'll see that the that the um, there are strategies for meetings and teaching mm -hmm. that have to do with with moving into a circle. I, I just kind of dis discovered it, and mm -hmm. eventually I asked for classrooms that did not have fixed seating, and mm -hmm. I had all of the chairs stacked in the corner. And on the first day of class, I sat there and I welcomed each student, asked their name, I said, "Take a chair." And I, and so they would take chairs and invariably they, they would put them in rows or what, what happened there in rows. Yep. And, uh, and if I didn't intervene, they would sit <laughs> in the same place the second time. Yep. And I, I pointed that out, you know, and, and I talked about the, the hierarchies of power that in, in the classroom, I, uh, you know, I didn't invent this, but, but I learned that uh, a thousand years ago, if you took a warrior from a thousand years ago and you put him on a battlefield today, they die. Uh, if you took a, a uh, surgeon from a thousand years ago and put them in a modern surgical operating theater, they would not know what to do. Mm -hmm. If you took students from ancient Sumeria four or 5,000 years ago and you put them in a modern classroom, everyone would know where to sit or stand mm -hmm. and who was in charge. So the circle breaks that up, yeah. uh, especially if the teacher sits down um, yeah. at least part of the time in the circle. And the uh, other thing... Um, other two things that I did was um, ask the students to form teaching teams. I eventually came up with a method for doing this, which is that I, before the first class, I would write on the whiteboards around the room the, the themes, you mm -hmm. know, identity, uh, presentation of self, public sphere, etc. And I'd say cluster around the theme that, that interests you or concerns you the most mm -hmm. and self-organize it so there's only three people at at each one. I, I was fortunate to be able to limit my, my classes mm -hmm. to you know, 15 to 25 nice. students. So um, I then said, okay, I want, I got this from, from Kathy Davidson, the kind of the think pair share. Mm -hmm. I said, I want you to take uh, three minutes to talk among yourselves and, and come up with a list of the four or five most important questions you would like to pursue about that subject matter. And then I would say, congratulations, you're the co-teaching team for that, <laughs> for that unit. Um, and you're, you're not responsible for the entire class. It was a three right. hour class. Right. Um, because I didn't want to drive an hour each way to, to Palo Alto. Right. And back. And a three hour class is a, it, it's kind of a monster. It's a chore. I, I'm, I've done those. Um, so, uh, and we broke it up in the, in the middle, but nice. I said for an hour of that class, I don't want you to try to cover everything that's in the syllabus for that week. I want you to pick out what you think is the most significant, that's the most engaging to you. Lovely. And this is a cooperative class and I want people to, to learn cooperatively, but I want you to compete with the other teams about getting people engaged and come up, come up with, with stunts, uh, you know, we'll talk about it. So first, we talked about it in the forum in a, in a, in a, a private topic. Mm -hmm. And then they came up with a written plan, which mm -hmm. they sent me and which I gave them feedback on. And then a week before their session, um, we would meet in my office hours and, and talk about the plan. Um, 
and and that evolved. Uh, the the the, the co-teaching team, they did come up with some 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 great ideas, and and I can get into that if we have time. But mm -hmm. um, they did a couple of each co-teaching team did a couple of the same things. One of them was to identify words and phrases from the the texts from my little mini lectures and, and from our discussions and put them in the wiki in, in a lexicon. And that right. we would pretend we were Wikipedians for, mm -hmm. for the week and all of us would build out that lexicon during the week. And ultimately that became part of the answer to the, the uh, inevitable question, what's gonna be on the test? And right. I, it enabled me to say, well, that, that's up to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> what? You, you create this lexicon and then you're going to create a narrative using all of the, the posts and, and writing that you've done during the, the term and using the words in lexicon in context. And you can use any medium you want to do it. So I had people doing YouTube videos and, and, and you, using uh, um, uh, Second Life. Uh, the other thing they did was they started out the class with a mind map of the material. Um, and I've got, I've got a, uh, I saved a bunch of the mind maps because I said, you can use a, a online mind mapping tool. Um, you can use Photoshop. Um, you can draw it with a, a pen and take a picture of it. And, um, I like that because it's lateral thinking. Mm -hmm. It, it's, it's not all words. Mm -hmm. Um, it shows the connections between things. It's, mm -hmm. it enables you to think in terms of a system. So, um, you know, I eventually said that, that uh, I am the, the teacher here. I give you the grade and, right. and, and your evaluation of me is not as important as my grade to you. And there's nothing we can do about that. Right. But short of that, let's see how much of my teaching power I can give to you. And Lovely. in return, how much responsibility you can take for your, for your learning. And, and I came to call them co-learners. Mm -hmm. um, I used to send a email out at the, the beginning of the term saying, you know, esteemed students. And for some reason, I started calling them esteemed co-learners. And that mm -hmm. makes a huge... Uh, Vocabulary difference. is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, setting the context and, mm -hmm. and, and, and scaffolding, all, all those things. It's, they look at me as the expert. They look at me as sure. the person who's going to dictate what's going to happen in the class. And I can use that power by saying, well, I couldn't do this in the beginning because I wasn't sure. You were nervous, right? This is 2005. Was, this is early. I was nervous. Um, a couple of times the magic happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember way back when um, Napster, a term that today's students might Wouldn't not know. even recognize, no. when Napster was a big deal, yes. the the Early 2099. Started a, a, a topic thread in, in the forum about is Napster stealing and do you use it? <laughs> there were like 400 responses. Boom. So um, I could say with some confidence after the third or fourth year, I can't guarantee that the magic will happen, but I can guarantee that it can happen and it has happened. And oh, I will man. do my best to set the conditions for that, but I, I can't force it. You've got to do it. Right. You know, I found that there were three or four people usually that got that and were, were willing to kind of discard their eternal chase of the best grades in, right. in favor of trying something new. And yeah. that there were three or four students who would kind of get it after they watched the, the first three or four. And mm -hmm. then there were three or four who would you know, kind of try to go along with it. And, and a couple who didn't get Tolerate it, it at all. Um, I tried to enable a community right. in the sense that people knew each other. I mean, people come into a, a, a class, even though they go to the same university, they don't necessarily know each no, other. They don't. Uh, I found that, that the co-learning community was most successful if I could arrange a dinner off campus for uh, you know, as many of the students as we could schedule, just mm -hmm. so we had some informal time to, to talk. In fact, once, at Berkeley, I had Biz Stone, the co-founder of Twitter, come to the class and answer the class's questions, and then we took him out for, for pizza. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just flash forward to my last course at, at Stanford. Um, I wrote on the board, um, 
and read all the things that they were required to do. They were required to do three posts in the forum and to, to blog weekly mm -hmm. and comment on the blogs, et cetera. Yeah. And then I said, this is what I'm requiring you to do. I'm going to leave. Um, I wrote my phone number on the board. <laughs> I said, if, if you have any questions, text me or call me. Um, and when you figured out what you want to do, um, write that down on the board and call me back. And so I wandered around campus for, for a while. <laughs> this is awesome. And, and they, they called me back. I came back and I have, I have pictures of the screen. I, oh, my I, goodness. I, uh, they had, well, you they, also had a reputation by then too, Howard. So that's that. Maybe is that interesting that they they've heard about you in 2015, whereas they didn't in 2005. That that well, could be it, interesting. It's interesting. I I I started out um, teaching a course on um, on virtual community at mm -hmm. Stanford, and then the um, chairman of the, the sociology department at at Berkeley asked me to cre recreate that that course magic for them. Um, also, you know, I'm me, I'm, I'm just, you mm -hmm. know, I didn't care if they fired me <laughs> Exactly. And, and I didn't need to act differently from who I am. And, uh, how, how long did it take before they called you, Howard? What, Do you remember uh, what, oh, when I'm, they called you back to the classroom? How long did that take? Cause they were uh, about 40 minutes. It'd be a fly on the wall at the beginning. What have been hilarious. Oh, okay. my. Well, when I came back, um, they had written what they wanted to do in a contrasting color next to mine. Wonderful. And, and you know, if, if, I, if I knew then what I know now, I, I would start that earlier. And in ideal circumstances, we would have a period of at least a week before we really got rolling to co-create the, the course. The, the, the course. And, and, and I know that Kathy Davidson. Kathy uh, talks about that a lot. And I've talked to her and others about this. And it's wonderful. It, it's, it's hard it, to create the magic, though. I've, ha I've had it work well. And I've had it work like, what's this guy doing? I, <laughs> tell me what I'm supposed to do. Well, it would be magic if it was a recipe. Right. Um, and uh, one thing that, that jumped out at me was, uh, well, those two schools, Berkeley and Stanford, th these were students who had spent their, at least their high school years, mm -hmm. really working to get into a sure. good school. And they really wanted to get a good grade. I, I think another thing I would do, what I know now, would be to say to everyone, um, you all get A's, let's forget about the grades. Yep. Anyway, back to the, back to the, to, uh, that last the class. Of me, uh, in the, in the course description, I said, uh, uh, courses by application only. And mm -hmm. uh, you need to, I, I wrote a pretty detailed description of how we were going to do things differently. And I said, you need to agree to this uh, right. in writing to me and tell me why you think this course is valuable mm -hmm. uh, to you. So I tried to limit it to people who really wanted to, to be there. Right. Um, you know, that's a luxury. Uh, it's a pretty select audience among a select audience among a select audience. And even but, like the courses I took with you in, in the summer, I mean, that's a select group. I mean, we all made a decision that we want to do this. Yes. I don't know how you would reconfigure learning institutions to make it more like that. But clearly, when, when, when students need to compete to get into a course and to, and to think about why they want to be in the course and articulate why they want to be in the course, that that's set things, sets things up uh, pretty nicely. Mm -hmm. So no. but, but just one more thing. Fred Turner, the, the fellow who invited me to teach there, said, you know, uh, we're inviting you because you're, you're right. We're, we're not really teaching about social media and mm -hmm. you know what to do. But also I want uh, the students here to see that they could be Howard Rheingold. So, uh -huh. uh, you know, the whole, whole tenure track thing was not, not part of my destiny. Right. And um, actually it was a bit of an opportunity cost in terms of, of making a living, sure. but... It, it it was gripping. I mean, uh, you know, writing a book is uh, an exciting process in one way, but it's also a, a slog and it's a, it's long a grind. Way. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I've done I don't know a dozen books. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I don't want to do any, any more. <laughs> I've that. got a colleague friend who said that about a decade or so ago and he's working on another one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's hard. Sometimes, sometimes the subject comes along and you, and, and, and it, it, it really grips you. It, is it magic? Is it the, like the right topic comes along and it's going to inspire you to do another one? I mean, could the magic well, happen in, again? In my case, I, I started out as a writer who was interested in technology. I was interested in a lot of things. And, mm -hmm. and I, was, uh, I, I wrote for magazines, and, which right. enables you to be a dilettante. You can choose a subject, and if you can mm -hmm. talk an editor into it, you can, you can go become an expert on that subject to some degree in, in a couple of weeks and, right. and, and write about it. Um, I had been using a typewriter and, for 10 years. And a, a telephone and a library card were my research tools. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten whiffs in the late 1970s that you could maybe use computers to do some of these things. Mm -hmm. Something called the New York Times Information Bank. I talked them into letting me use it. Um, you, it had a 110 baud acoustic right. coupler modem and you could, you wow. could browse their index of their uh, articles and, and it's very slowly print one out. So I, oh, yeah. I, I got the idea that maybe I could connect to this, to information. Um, and then I heard that people were using computers to write with because, uh, you know, you type a page and then you, you mark it up and then you type it again and the mm -hmm. typing it again, the moving is the slog. Yeah. You cut things and you, 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 you paste them. Um, what was the first word processor you using? Was this WordStar? When, when was this? This is like about 83 uh, I found, or so. Well, I found an article um, written by Alan Kay at, uh -huh. in the Scientific American called My Microelectronics and the Personal Computer. You can still find it. And it was yep, visionary. Yep. Yeah, and I know Alan Kay's work really well. I've met him a couple of times. I'm he a was, big fan. He, he, he had been working at, at a place called Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Yep. Where he did small was, talk and the Dyna book and all the fun stuff. I was using WordStar. That's another story. We're probably going to have <laughs> we'll run out of time. Uh, to, to move uh, a sentence or a paragraph in WordStar, you use the arrow keys to move to the beginning, and then you right. then Control K K, and uh -huh. then to the end Control K B, and then the frightening thing Control K X, it disappears yeah. into what, what Ted N Nelson calls the abominable hidey hole. <laughs> One of the least remarked but most horrible parts of the user interface is making things disappear. Right. Yeah. When, when you, when you it's want to disconcerting. Then when when word came along and you could just you could drag and drop, that was that was great. A anyway, I talked um uh Xerox into letting me write articles about people at Park. Oh, cool. Which was a very dream job. Oh and yes. It was, it was such oh, a yes. place. And I, I had my own hard disk. It was about this big and it was five megabytes and I mm -hmm. got to use the Alto. Uh, I asked if I could take an Alto home and they said, well, yeah, you could, but um, you're not gonna have a printer. You're not gonna have a network. And right. uh, if, if it breaks, you're gonna be last in line to get it repaired. I'm sorry I didn't <laughs> yeah. do and that. You would have so, one behind you. <laughs> so in that process at, at Park, I, I met Doug Engelbart, and I realized that these were not just great tools for writing. These were mind amplifiers. And right. so since then, long answer to your question, since then, in the, in the early 1980s, I've really been writing about mind amplifiers, whether mm -hmm. it was uh, personal computers or social media or mobile media. Um, I wrote about other things before. I wrote a book on untranslatable words, uh, mm -hmm. etc. But for the most part, I I have grown old with this technology that came along when I was in my 30s as an adult writer. It was a tool for me. It's like uh, starting out with a horse and buggy and then having your own spaceship. It's right. What I must use Google a hundred times. Of a course day. we do. Um, of course we do. And, and video, you know, we knew when it was just green letters on a slowly moving screen that mm -hmm. eventually we would have video and audio and, and it's all of the world that we had hoped for plus hell. Right. Uh, well, yeah, the, the, that's the, another the floodgates opened and, and oh, at least another hour. And how, 
So I remember taking the course with you in the summer and, and I remember there was some interesting discussions. One of my, one of my key things that I do when I work with faculty, I talk about flip or I talk about anything because I don't want to be in the walls of flip all the time, but how do we open the, this world to faculty and students both of how to really take control of this technology to amplify their minds? I mean, how, how do we get them to, I don't know if it's the blue pill versus the red pill and, and that kind of thing we're talking to Morpheus, but how, I, I know so many people that don't, they're still in this old world in, in, in a ways of, of doing teaching and doing learning the old way. How do we get them to, to think that this is the, this is the way to do it? Well, there are a couple answers to that question. One is um, I'm a big fan of the, the small liberal arts uh, college. I, I went to read and, and when I started looking around for people who knew what they were doing, I, I found them at, at places like the University of Mary Washington. Mm -hmm. um, right, with Jim. And, I, and... I went to the director of the Center for Innovations and Learning at Stanford. I said, why do so few of the faculty use blogs and wikis and, mm -hmm. and forums? And he said, oh, that's easy. Um, there's a knowledge factory and you're hired here because of your publications in your field or your patents. And uh, if you're supposed to teach courses and you never show up, that could be a problem. But there are no positive incentives for innovating in, in, right. in, in teaching. Right, very true. Interesting aside to that was some years later, Sebastian Thrun, who was, had been a teacher at Stanford said, I'm, I'm quitting Stanford. I have 100,000 students in my MOOC, and this is going to replace the university. Mm -hmm. By golly, I don't know, weeks later, there's a new position at Stanford, the assistant provost for online learning. Right. As far as I know, and I haven't, I haven't been there in four years, that really hasn't resulted in a lot more faculty doing this. So back, back to your question there, um, I realized that, that I, it, it's just not in my nature to be the person who's going to change this institution from the, from the top down. Right. Who, care, who cares about me? But I'm going to go and find and, and try to support and network mm -hmm. those innovators out there who are doing it. It turns out there's a lot of them. It's yes. like the yeast in the, in, in the dough. And they're in elementary school and high school as well as They're college. everywhere. Mm -hmm. They are in the knowledge factories, but mostly they're in places where teaching rather than creating knowledge is, is the, the, the main goal. Our core goal. Of the institution. So mm -hmm. I did over 100 interviews, like the one we're doing now, did a, a video interview and wrote a blog post. And the, uh, was now known as the Connected Learning Alliance uh, published it. And, uh, and those 100 uh, um, plus interviews and a lot more stuff is on my website, wrangle.com. There's a, a tab that says learning on it. So in answer to your question, I think, unfortunately, like in many fields, we have to wait for the, the old folks to retire and the, mm -hmm. the younger folks to take over. But in the meantime, um, and, and this, was, this was something that the, the MacArthur Foundation's uh, uh, digital media and, and learning effort really catalyzed was let's network the people mm -hmm. who are leading the way. And I'll have to say Twitter was an enormous oh, help yeah. for me. And, and you know, there's a lot of problems with, with Twitter and it, it's kind of hellish uh, for some yep. people in, in, in some ways. But for me, I found that um, there's a fellow by the name of Will Richardson. You probably know about yep. his work. And he had yep. written a, a book about using blogs, wikis, and other media in, in the classroom that was gave me a start. Mm -hmm. And I found that he was on Twitter. And I looked at all the people he followed and I started following them. Yes. And, the, the, the Twitter ed tech community was, was really supporting in my learning all the things that I, I talked about before and bouncing ideas off. So there, there is a network and I, and I think the network is growing and I think that, that, that people um, initiate others in, into the network. And um, will that change institutions? Again, I, you know, I don't uh, claim expertise in knowing in how this happens. And, um, but one thing that did occur to me was that I, I was invited to give a, uh, a lecture at, uh, at Berkeley. And uh, part, of the, part of the deal was I'm supposed to meet with their faculty and their students a couple of times and have some, an ongoing project. And so I, I talked about my history using these media. And I said, and I talked about 
creating my own online classes. And I said, well, ultimately, what's the next step? Uh, what if we eliminate the teacher entirely? Mm -hmm. What if a group of people want to learn something? Um, we, ha we have tools today that we've never had before, okay. except for a few dedicated autodidacts. If you wanted to learn, schools had a monopoly on right. learning. Yep. Nowadays, ask any 14-year-old, um, how do you configure a server or learn to play the ukulele or, sure. or, or, or calculus? Or be and awesome at say, Fortnite or whatever. They'd say YouTube or, or Khan Academy. You know, mm -hmm. we've got YouTube, we've got Wikipedia, we've got Google, um, we've got Zoom, um, mm -hmm. all kinds of tools. What's missing is the knowledge of how do we use this. Right. And there is a, a professional teacher class. And we do try to perfect our, our skills and our profession. But humans are learners. We love right. to Definitely. learn. We could, we could learn what's missing. The missing ingredient is how do we use all these tools? How do we, right. we figure out what are the best resources? How do we clump those resources together? How are they connected? Um, how do we make a- How do we use them the right way? And, and to speak yeah. of Alan Kay, I, I, had, I actually I talked to my students today because I teach software engineering and I talk a lot, a lot about Alan, but I talked about Agile and OO and they dug in and they found Simula, which was the precursor to Smalltalk and Alan Kay actually went over and visited them before. And I had the privilege of meeting Kristen Nygar before he passed away. And in early 2001, I think it was, I met, I met Kristen. And, and it's just like, I lost my train of thought now. Where was I talking about it, Howard? And well, um, myself and this, is, this is completely... Oh, Kristen said, this is what he said to me. He was in a class and, and someone asked him why he was using a Mac and not a Windows machine. And he said, I, I need computers to help me work, not to make me work. And yeah. I think that's, that's one of the keys in, in this discussion is that, we need to find the right way to let these tools well amplify our knowledge and amplify our communications, and and that's so key to this. Uh, well, I, I just I just thought you know I tried to learn Python and and I got a little ways into it, but but one thing I did recognize is that object oriented uh, languages in which you're able to uh, a a programmer can create their own class mm -hmm. and then other people can can use it. That mm -hmm. that was a, kind of an equivalent to to what I came to call pedagogy. Anyway, the, the, the project at, yep. at, at, at Berkeley, um, I proposed, let's come up with a pedagogy handbook mm -hmm. uh, and, and make it open to the world. Right. So I came back and I met um, two or three times with graduate students and, and faculty there, but I also put my laptop on the table and opened it to uh, what was called the Illuminate at that time, which is okay. sort of what, like what we're doing now. I used Twitter and Facebook to invite others there. And what's interesting, so we started this project. What's interesting is that after a couple of months, all of the, the, the faculty and graduate students had, had dropped out of it, but uh, people from Mexico and Japan right. and, and Germany had joined in and we created a community. And I don't know, after about a, a year and a half, I just dropped out of it. And the community took over. They're still going. You weren't, you weren't needed to be the seed anymore. You, you planted yeah. that. You grew that community and it, and it keeps going without you. And that's so important. Exactly. Yes. I mean, again, it's the same thing. Student agency. Um, right. We're doing this together. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, give you a push down the hill. But then uh, it's, you know, it's time for you to, to, to steer Take the, the training thing. wheels off. Steer this thing. So I think part of the future... It's not, MOOCs are not going to replace universities and online learning is not going to replace face-to-face -face learning. But I think more and more people in the world will be doing more and more of this pedagogical learning. That's got to affect, you know, if we're, we're still doing this 50 years from now, that has to affect the way the institutions do it um, and, and make it more of a co-learning experience, or at least that's my hope. Oh, definitely. We're, we're doing a lot of that at the Dr. Montre, and I can't make this, this conversation too long with our, with our new model. And actually, um, I'd love to have you come and talk to us. Mimi Ito's coming to talk at our, our big uh, national conference that happens every year in December. So she's going to get to experience what's happening. We just kickstarted a new complete um, degree program model in August. We're in the middle of the first semester. So she might get a chance to see what's going on with our new designs here at the Tec de Montre. So I'm really excited to go see her. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it to the conference, but I really would like to go see her, see her talk and meet her there.
Because I know you've done work with Mimi before. Yes, yes. Well, Mimi was really um, the, the the person who encouraged me to do the interviews uh, mm -hmm. that, that ended up on the Con uh, Connected Learning Alliance site, and and we we uh, we did a a a MOOC for people who are interested in learning connected learning. Con I think it's still up there, connectedlearning.net. Mm -hmm. and, and, yep. and she gave me the, the, the wonderful privilege of coming up with a dream team. So I had uh, Mike Wesh and, and Mimi Ito, of course, and, and Jim Groom. And That's the, that was my first encounter with you, like not from reading, but seeing you online because I watched the work that you did with Jim. I think it's the one you did... Uh, prepare your toolbox with Jim and Alan Levine. Yes. And so, you know, Jim Groom pushed me to, you know, instead of um, having your students use your, your blog, you should make them create their own blogs mm -hmm. and then syndicate it. The Reclaim. With Reclaim hosting and to, yeah. to, to become your own publisher, and which I think, you know, one of the, we're not talking about the dystopia that the, the web has become in so many ways, but I, I think, one of the ways to maintain some green space there that's not owned by Facebook um, is, is, is to in, encourage people to be their own publishers. And, and WordPress and Reclaim Hosting, um, MediaWiki, mm -hmm. um, there, there are people and institutions and tools that are enabling people to go outside of that cookie cutter world that's given to us by the big institutions that are trying to en enclose the internet. And I think that's extremely important. Everything that we use that's interesting, YouTube or, or, or Wikipedia or Google, they, they were started mm -hmm. uh, by, of course. by people who had the, the, the opportunity and the right to make something in their dorm room. Um, yep. That's now you got to join one of these giant institutions if you really want to innovate. So I, mm -hmm. I like to I don't see. We, I think we're going to ever turn that around completely, but I think we can preserve some of that. that edu punk yeah. culture, as, as yeah. Jim and others and Brian Lamb call it. Definitely, I like to call myself an edu punk as well. Wow, we're up and on forty minutes, Howard, and we could go forever. And I, but I want to be respectful of your time too. And I'm just so appreciative of of you being here. There's that. There's those classic questions that I, I asked that I was going to ask you about. Okay, and, I'll give you uh, shorter answers. Okay. No, you can go as long as you want. I'm, I'm worried about me abusing your time, Howard. Um, I can go as long as I want here. So my first question, I started asking this because this happened on a, on a podcast with Terry Green asking Bonnie Stahoviak uh, from, from these two questions, or the first one. Do you remember the first album or maybe other media format that you bought? And can you relate that to your thoughts on education and teaching and learning? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a roundabout answer. Sure, I love that. Um, when when I was 14 or 15 in Phoenix, Arizona, a long time ago, um, television was black and white. You had to go up and change the dial if you wanted to change the station, and uh, there was no PBS. Mm -hmm. But there were at un some universities, Arizona State University had uh, had a, a educational TV station. Right. So I turned to that, and there was a, a fellow in a, like a gray kimono in a blank room sitting there silently. And after a while, he reached and he got a cup of tea, and he drank the tea, and he put the tea down, and he started talking. And that was Alan Watts. And so I, I went to the bookstore the next day and um, asked for Alan Watts books. And on the shelf with the Alan Watts books were um, the Tao Te Ching, um, mm -hmm. and, the, and the I Ching, um, and something called the Evergreen Review that had an issue on pataphysics. Mm -hmm. I won't get into that now, but one of the pataphysicians was a musician by the name of Eric Satie. So my, my first album was definitely Take Five by Dave, Dave Burbeck. Excellent. And, um, and, and this was an exciting time. It was a time when, when white kids were beginning to catch on to mm -hmm. black music, it was before, right before the the Beatles came along. But Eric Satie, if you ever listen to his stuff, it's I've been listening to it all these years. It's other dimensional. It really puts me into a different place. Dave Brubeck um, 
I fell in love with modern jazz and there was a nightclub in San Francisco called the Black Hawk at Turk and Hyde, which if you know San Francisco, it's in the middle of what's called the Tenderloin, which is a very dangerous place for a 14 year old kid to be in the middle of the night. But they were the only place you could go hear live jazz as a, a minor because they, they had a chicken wire divider that divided where they served liquor from the, mm -hmm. so I heard Brubeck, Thelonious wow. Monk, Dizzy Gillespie, the modern wow. jazz cat, took the Greyhound bus from Phoenix, Arizona. Oh my. And then, you know, when the, when musicians started showing up, Ray, Ray Charles, James Brown, I started going to those concerts. So, you know, that was the, the whole, you know, boomer mythos was, was being immersed in that, that music. Right. Wow. No, that's, I love that. And, and one of my favorite words in the world is serendipity and that you found that book beside the other book and it led you down that path. It's awesome. Yeah. And then the other question I'm going to ask Howard um, is, can you name a single or break the rules and go for two or three or whatever teachers that were formative for you that were your teachers and your view on education? Okay, so um, I objected to being forced to sit still mm -hmm. in, in rows and columns all day long. Surprise, surprise. And, um, and if it was today, I'm sure they would have medicated me. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I knew most of what they were trying to teach me. It was boring uh, to me. Um, and they gave me a bunch of tests and, and uh, um, I skipped a grade, but still uh, teachers kept viewing me as disruptive. And, and you yeah. know, I, I really wasn't a bad kid. I, I, I was not a delinquent. There were a lot of delinquents in sure. our school. Um, Teachers sent um, outlaws to the art room. <laughs> okay. I was very, very fortunate in that um, my mother was the art teacher. And my mom's philosophy was we're all artists. We all, all humans take pleasure in and need to express ourselves creatively. But when we're very young, someone looks over our shoulder and says, well, that doesn't look like a horse. Don't, don't be an artist, go be a dentist mm -hmm. or, or something else. She taught permission long before she taught technique. So she was a formative teacher. Wow. Um, another one I have to mention, I went to another school um, because it was closer to our house. And in the fifth grade, this teacher hated me. And you know, I was a redhead and, uh, and you know, a little mischievous, um, but it was more than that. Uh, and uh, I stopped going to school. I just, I went to the, the nearest orange grove and read science fiction books all day. Right. That, that lasted about one day. Until the <laughs> school called my parents in for a meeting and my parents came into the meeting and said, it's, it's not him, it's you. And so they, they sent me back to my mom's school and I entered a fifth grade class and the teacher there, Mrs. Birch said, we've got a newspaper for the class. It's called the ink pad and we're gonna go to press soon, press being a mimeograph. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. sheet. And she said, someone needs to go interview the principal. Can you go do that? And so maybe that's where I started becoming. Wow. Um, did, probably she talked to my mom, but how did she know that? I don't know. Thank I, you, Mrs. Birch. Like, I love the right. Um, <laughs> thank you, just, Mrs. Birch, for giving us Howard. Yeah, thank you. So, um, wow. Those, those, those were uh, definitely uh, formative teachers uh, for me. Wonderful answer. I love these questions because they came from a different couple of people and, and I, I like the different answers that can come out of these. And it's definitely fun to, to look back a few years. Wonderful. Howard, how can people find more about you? I'm going to put everything in the show notes, but I'll let you uh, well, sign out two, with that. Two ways, reingold.com, R-H-E-I-N-G-O-L-D. And these days I'm an artist and um, I still write about things like we're talking about, but I also make things. You can see a bunch of stuff in-, in, in I'll, take, I'll have to take a screenshot from us now to use for the photo on the blog post, actually. Um, so I'm, uh, I love Patreon. Patreon is a site where, where you can, people can pay $2 a month or $50 a month and support people who are making blogs or videos or, or write things or do performances. And uh, so Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Howard Reingold, one word. Um, you can go there and about half the content is open to anybody um, mm -hmm. who goes there. And the other half is, is, is for patrons. And patrons get art postcards of my art or I make them a wooden pen. Um, mm -hmm. 
so or if you're if you're um an angelic really woman, ambitious we can get a shoes i will paint a pair of shoes for you yeah so i love that because i quit i, I quit facebook for a lot of reasons i hate it so much um but they're it's their business model it's you know let, let's collect as much information on you as possible and sell that information or, or, or broker that information to people who want to sell you things or, or change your mind about things or right. persuade you politically. Patreon's business model is some people pay other people. And I, I support other people, yep. other creators on, on Patreon. And every month they take money out of your credit card and give it to this person and they take a little cut of that. And yep. I don't think that that's going to rule the web, but it's so much healthier than surveillance capitalism. I think it's wonderful. I think in the slip learning networks there, we haven't really pushed it much at all over since we're a nonprofit and we're, 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 we're not needing a lot of money, but we're actually there. And, and I, yeah, I've supported a lot of people there as well. Audrey Waters, Alan Levine. Um, a lot of our friends are there as well as a, uh, say uh brian alexander has his stuff there as well so there's a lot of good stuff happening on patreon i i definitely agree so i'll point people to all that once again thank you so much howard i'm, I'm so glad i got the opportunity to meet you earlier this year online and, and again here and, and maybe someday i'll get to get to see you up there in california or you can come yeah, down here to mexico do. for come sure visit in, in the spring or the summer when my garden is in, in its glory Wonderful. Sounds great. I'm going to hit the stop record button now here, Howard. Nope.